Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Building Our Faith, an Episcopal 101 program. I think this is number 10. Becky, were you nine? What number were you? And you're still muted. I thought I was fifth. Oh, maybe I'm sixth. Okay, I can't count. It's been a day. So uh, I'm next anyway. I'm Bill Stanton. I'm the priest in charge up at St. Albans Episcopal Church in Windsor, Colorado, part of the Front Range, which extends all the way from Wellington all the way down to Littleton, one of the larger, larger um, regions in our diocese. How do I go from page to page is the next thing. There we go. <clears throat> Am I moving it or is that somebody else moving it? That was you. If you was... hover at the lower left, you will find a little menu that oh, okay. will advance. Okay. Well, let's begin. Let's begin with prayer. Um, we're going to pray the Collect for All Saints, this, that holiday we just celebrated, um, as a way to center ourselves and to come into um, the right presence of spirit in order to discuss the uplifting topics of death and resurrection. So let us First, take a couple deep breaths. Put your feet firmly on the ground. Breathe in grace and exhale love. With the spirit of God to dwell with us and to calm our, our thoughts and our hearts. Let us set aside any stresses or anxieties we have brought with us today. Any tasks that might await us this evening or tomorrow. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit together your elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Give us grace so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those ineffable joys that you have prepared for those who truly love you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you in the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God in glory everlasting. Amen. So before we begin, I want to tell you all a little bit about all uh, St. Albans. <clears throat> um, like many Episcopal churches in the United States. St. Albans started out as a house church. Um, oh. It was attended by a small community of believers, approximately eight families in Windsor, Colorado. One of those families was the great aunt of one of, one of my former junior wardens, of which he's very proud of. In 1905, this community of believers began worshiping once a month at the Christian church, which you can see here, which is located directly across the street from St. Albans' present location. Their worship consisted of evening prayer or morning prayer. And once a month, they would gather together in the church where a traveling priest would come and uh, offer communion. In 1910, the Reverend Dean D.B. Bunnell, or Dean Bunnell, because he was not only rector at Trinity Episcopal Church in Greeley, but also dean of a seminary, St. John's Seminary, which was also located in Greeley, attended a tea at one of the church women's homes where they talked to him and they said, we want our own church. And he said, what do you intend to do about it? And if you know most church women, that's all you have to say. They took it and ran. From 1910 to 1912, the women of St. Albans began to fundraise. And this, in this time, had sufficient money to buy the land, which is across the street from the Christian church, the hymnals, as well as retain a contract to build the altar. The cornerstone was laid in 1914, 
and work on the church began with the nave being constructed first and then the parish or what they called it as guild hall. And the guild hall hosted dances from the local high schools, community meetings, governmental meetings. Um, it was very active. The work was completed and the church consecrated in 1932. And the same service, they also did a mortgage burning ceremony because they had raised enough money to pay off their debt with Dean Bunnell as victor. Dean Bunnell began serving at age 70 and served at Ann Albans for 21 years when he retired in 1957 at age 91. We don't have that anymore in our church, <laughs> but Dean Bunnell, as you can see, I hope you can see his picture. Um, so uh, was a very, very influential priest in St. Albans life and history. St. Albans today looks pretty much like this. In 2015, we did a capital campaign and expanded our parish hall, which allowed us to go from approximately three round ta tables to 10 round tables. Um, and this is the altar today. The, at the very top of the altar is a stained glass window of uh, Jesus knocking at the door. And um, if you look at this section here, it is a different color because when Father Warner was there, his two boys who were young kids were playing baseball and they threw a baseball right through Jesus's stomach. <clears throat> Father Warner wasn't home, but when he got home and was going to take them bowling, they still wanted to know if they were able to go bowling or if they were gonna be in trouble because of Jesus's broken stomach window. On the north side of the church is a picture of St. Alban, our patron saint. And St. Alban is what we call a proto-martyr. He was the first martyr of Britain. He was, tradition tells us, he was a Roman soldier who offered shelter to a cleric who was being persecuted during the Diocletian persecutions and offered sanctuary to this cleric. And as he was offering sanctuary, he began to talk to the cleric who converted him and Alban was actually baptized Christian. When the authorities came to take the cleric by force, they found out that they, he was at Alban's home. Alban exchanged cloaks with him and they took Alban to the governor and when the governor said, who are you? He threw off his cloak and said, I am Alban, I'm a Christian. The governor gave him an opportunity to um, recant his baptism and Alban declined in which he was then beheaded. And at the side of his beheading, it is stated that a spring broke up through the ground and began healing people. And that is the site of the original St. Alban's church in Britain. just a little bit about who we are. The reason why we're here though, is to talk about the theological themes of death and resurrection as we experience them through the church, through the columbarium and cemetery. So as always, I think it's always important for us to look at, um, get some defining themes here. So a columbarium is a structure with an inbuilt niche inbuilt niche spaces called columbaria that store the cremated remains of the faithful. The name columbarium and columbaria comes from the Latin for dove or columba and was originally referred to the niches where doves lived. <clears throat> um, they've found columbari or columbas, columbarias in ancient Israel um, as well as Rome. The columbaria were used widely in ancient Rome where cremation was the norm until approximately the, 20, the second century BC. And the reason was the Romans, because Rome lived in a very pluralistic society, there was many, many, many religions that um, Rome allowed to exist. Some of them were mystery religions such as the Christian religion uh, and other mystery religions they didn't want dead people to come alive again and walk. And so they thought if they cremated them and their remains, 
then there would be no body for them to resurrect. A cemetery is a place where the remains of dead people are buried or otherwise interred. The word cemetery comes from the Greek word for sleeping place. Cemetery generally refers to the land that is specifically designated for burial ground and is originally applied to the Roman catacombs. Graveyards are cemeteries found on church grounds. St. Albans, we don't have a graveyard or a cemetery, but we do have a columbarium. Modern cemeteries now include columbaria as well as a mausoleum, which are big structures that house either the body of one person or generally a family. This is St. Albans columbarium. It's a small columbarium consisted of two rows of niches. Uh, the top level is pretty much uh, filled with the remains of several um, faithful departed. And you can see this was one of the flower arrangements that um, was donated to the church following Mrs. Warner's funeral. Um, the columbaria is a sacred space. We use it for our uh, garden of repose during Easter or the following Monday, Thursday service. So we'll put candles out, um, allow people to come in through the door, which to the outside, which is right over here and uh, sit for an hour with Christ. We also have several members whose family members are here that like to come at least once a week, decorate their niche and uh, sit with them. The columbarium, so if you're looking at the church altar, the columbarium is to the right of the church, uh, right behind the organ. Windsor has one cemetery, it's called Lakeview Cemetery, which was incorporated in 19, or 1890. And several people are interred there. Another cemetery that I've done several internments in is Fort Logan National Cemetery down in Denver, um, which is impressive if you've ever attended one of their interment ceremonies or have ever been down there. And now I just wanna talk a little bit about the biblical history of death or how people in the Bible viewed death. We could start with the history of death, but that goes back way beyond my forte. So I thought we'd just talk about the biblical history. For the ancient Israelites, death was essentially the end. It was an eternal sleep. We know this because from the Hebrew scriptures of Ecclesiastes, um, which says, you know, for what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and to dust all return. Also, Ecclesiastes prepares the people of Israel to enjoy life with the wife whom you loved all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Shoal to which you are going. Also in Job, it states, man dies and is laid low. As waters fail, fail, I think that's fall, from a lake and a river wastes away and dries up. So man lies down and rises not again. Till the heavens are no more, he will not awake or be roused out of his sleep. So for the ancient Israelites, death was eternal sleep. Eternal life for the Israelites meant life of the nation, not the individual. And we get this from the Abrahamic covenant, which was in Genesis, where God promised and covenanted with Abraham, I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God promised eternal life to the nation of Israel. So that is the reason why ancient Israelites, as long as their nation survived, they knew that eternal life existed. However, <clears throat> during the, the exile, um, as we know from reading scripture, 
Israelite tribes began to assimilate with all their cultures. Um, and those cultures and their beliefs began to merge and different ideas began to merge. Shoal, which was in Job described as the land of gloom and deep darkness, sort of began to emerge. Shoal was not heaven, not hell, but a place of eternal sleep where both the righteous and the wicked shared the same fate, a tradition taught us in Babylonian culture. And then during Judaism's Hellenistic period, which ranges between around the fourth century BCE and the second century CE, where there was a lot of influence of Greek or a lot of Greek influence on the teachings of the church and the teachings of the people at the time, thoughts and beliefs of the finality and nature of death changed. Resurrection of the dead became a thing. In Isaiah, Isaiah pro uh, proclaimed, your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. And also in the book of Daniel, it states, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So in Daniel, Daniel pro um, prophesied that all at one point will be resurrected, both the righteous and the wicked where they will receive judgment. Those who are righteous will go on to live an everlasting life and those who are judged, who are judged wicked will suffer uh, punishment. At this time, Sheol became divided into three areas or divisions where the dead would be assigned depending upon their moral behavior, whether or not they were righteous or wicked during their life. One of those areas or divisions was Gehenna, um, where the wicked were tortured by fire. Jesus talks a lot about Gehenna, um, where, you know, the weeds will be collected together and burned. Um, and so Gehenna was based upon Gehenom, or the Valley of Hinnom, where children were sacrificed to the Canaan God, Canaanite god Moloch in ancient Israel time. It was also that area beyond the, the walls of old Jerusalem where the people of Jerusalem burned municipal rubbish. So that set the, I, the Christian, that set the stage for the Christian idea of hell with fire and brimstone and punishment. Um, interestingly though, um, I went to Israel two years ago and Gay Hinnom, this Valley of Hinnom, this Gehenna is now a beautiful park that exists outside the old, the walls of the old city of Jerusalem. In first century Judaism, there was no consensus on the nature of death. We know that the Sadducees, the socially and economically upper echelon of the Jewish society, did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Rather, they believed in the traditional con Jewish concept of shoal for those who died. The shoal was an eternal sleep. I have a question here. Oops. Pharisees were the middle class. They were socially and economic. They were middle class socially and economically. Compared to the Sadducees, they were pretty liberal. They did believe in the resurrection of the dead. And then you had the Essenes, a mystic and ap apocalyptic sect of Judaism, which objected to the running of the way the temple was being run. They thought it was being um, run poorly and being, um, now my brain just fried, uh, that the temple was being um, led down a path of uncleanliness. And they were waiting for a Messiah to come and restore the holiness of the temple. Um, interestingly, the Essenes had two ideas of two messiahs. One was more of a war hero who would come and defeat the Romans. And the other was a messianic or priestly messiah um, in the nature of Christ who would come and um, restore that holiness to the temple and make sure that it was running right. It is important though to know that resurrection in first century 
Judaism meant bodily resurrection and not a symbolic or incorporeal resurrection. Uh, many of the other traditions, uh, other cultures, such as the Egyptian culture and a lot of Hellenistic cultures uh, believed that resurrection was either symbolic or um, incorporeal, meaning it was outside of the body. So the, the Jewish and the Judaic uh, teachings was that the physical body would be resurrected. Hades came into play. Jesus talks a lot about Hades. And Hades has a number of different meanings in the New Testament. Um, Hades is a Roman phrase, a Greek or Roman um, reference, and it refers to both the grave as a place of bodily decay. It was also a place of the punishment for the wicked. Uh, the Furies were sent by Hades, the god of um, Hades, to punish those who were wicked. And it was also a general term for the unseen realm of the dead much like Sheol. Which brings us to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. This, um, Jesus's passion, his death and resurrection is documented in all four gospels. And it became the basis upon which the universal church was built for which we thank the apostle Paul. Paul, who was a Pharisee, so he had no, no, re no reason to doubt in the resurrection of the dead. And it was him who proclaimed the resurrection of Christ throughout all of the region. And I'm very Pauline. I love Paul. So that's why I'm, I give him all the credit here. So the Episcopal teaching on death and resurrection. Well, as with most things Episcopal, there is a variety of beliefs concerning death and the afterlife. Why would we agree when it's much easier to have our own beliefs? and we can then discuss them. However, we do have some basic teachings or beliefs of the Episcopal Church, and these are those stated in the Apostles' Creed where we state, I believe in the resurrection of the dead and life everlasting. The Nicene Creed, which we say during Eucharist, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come as a way of looking forward. And then the Articles of Our Faith, also known as the Catechism, all of which emphasize life after death. And even in our own Eucharistic prayer, especially Eucharistic prayer A, we proclaim the mystery of faith, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. So our catechism teaches, if you have your Book of Common Prayer and ever look at the back, um, which I highly recommend, it's, but then I'm sort of a geek in that way, um, so it asks the questions, why did Jesus take our human nature? To which the answer, which the church, church teaches, is that the divine son became human, so that in him human beings might be adopted as children of God and be made heirs of God's kingdom. What was the great importance of Jesus' suffering and death? That by his obedience, even to suffering and death, Jesus made the offering for which we could not make. And in him, we are freed from the power of sin and reconciled to God. And what is the significance of Jesus's resurrection? By his resurrection, Jesus overcame death and opened for us the way to eternal life. And then the most important question that I think, which is why I highlighted it, how can we share in his victory over sin, suffering, and death? We share in his victory when we are baptized into the new covenant and become living members of Christ. Which takes us back to our altar. In St. Albans altar, you will see that our columbarium is directly across from our baptismal font. We have two baptismal fonts, our stone font that sits there because it is way too heavy to move. And then we also have a portable font that we bring up made out of pine, a pine tree uh, that we bring up when we do baptisms. But I like the idea of the columbarium and the baptismal font being right across from each other in this altar because the death, resurrection, and baptism all symbolize essentially the same things. In Jesus's death, he was buried and resurrected. And in baptism, 
we are crucified with him when we repent. We are buried with him when we are baptized. And this is showing a full immersion baptism. But in the Episcopal Church, we do sprinkling. A lot of times we do sprinkling as being symbolic of being buried with Christ. And then we are, when we arise out of the water, we are being resurrected in a new form in the resurrection of Christ's body and the church. The sacrament of baptism, we die to ourselves and are resurrected anew in the body of Christ. We know this because in our prayer over the water in our prayer book, we, we pray, we thank you, Father, for the water of baptism. In it, we are buried with Christ in his death, and by it, we share in his resurrection. Through it, we are reborn by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in joyful obedience to your Son, we bring into fellowship those who come to him in faith, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I have to admit, and I probably most priests will admit this, maybe, I don't know, we can ask, <clears throat> but baptism and burial are my two favorite rites in our church, uh, with Eucharist being a very close third. But the symbolism behind baptism, where we die to ourselves, and then we are resurrected in a new form, in one body that is Christ that we know that we're part of something bigger is an incredible, just an incredible experience that is new every time I celebrate a baptism. And with the burial rite, not only is the language just incredibly beautiful, we are reminded that we do not die alone, but that we are rejoined in a new way with a new, new group of people who have gone before the great cloud of witnesses, the communion of saints, those who are connected to us, knitted to us as we prayed in that very first prayer at All Saints. Let's see. Wow, cool. Abigail Mooney just said, um, huh. Terry says, the Sadducees were sad, you see. <laughs> That's funny. And Abigail Mooney says, this was the week, the week of the fourth anniversary that I got to meet myself, got to baby or baptize her baby, Marion. And I have to tell you, that was, well, she was such a good baby and she was such a beautiful baby. And um, I was very honored to do that. So, if you look in our prayer book at page 507, um, these are notes that talk about our burial rite. And just so that you all know, our burial rite liturgy is an Easter liturgy. It finds all meaning in the resurrection. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we too shall be raised. This liturgy is characterized by joy in the certainty that Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. However, this joy does not make our human grief unchristian. The very love we have for each other in Christ brings deep sorrow when we are parted by death, particularly when that death is longstanding and deep. Jesus himself wept at the grave of his friend. So while we rejoice that one, the one we love has entered into the nearer presence of our Lord, we sorrow in sympathy with those who mourn. So these are, as I believe uh, Mother Melissa, Melissa Adzema from St. Stephen's, talked about, um, and probably Mother Liz, uh, you know, the Episcopal Church, we follow the tenet, lex orende, lex credendi, the law of prayer is the law of faith. And we find what we believe as what we pray. And these are some of the prayers that we read at our burial rite. And I have to admit, I'm a right one sort of guy. I like the language, 
I like the flow, I like the poetry. So I'm bringing some of our right one poetry and traditional language to bear here. So if you've ever attended a, uh, an Episcopal funeral, you would hear the words, I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand by, at the latter day upon the earth. And though his body, though this body be destroyed, yet shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself and mine eyes shall behold, and not as a stranger. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to, to himself. For if we live, we live unto the Lord, and if we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, even so saith the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. I don't know if you've, if any of you got to watch the uh, burial of the celebration um, service for General Colin Powell. Uh, that was a right one service, and you would have heard these words spoken by our presiding bishop. And it talks about that relationship with essentially baptism and death being intertwined. You know, when we intertwine our hands in prayer. Um, that is sort of like the relationship between death and resurrection and baptism. Um, and then the proper preface, if there is a Eucharistic service, it prays through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who rose victorious from the dead and the comfort us with the blessed hope of everlasting life. For to thy faithful people, O Lord, life is changed, not ended. And when our mortal body doth lie in death, there is prepared for us a dwelling place eternal in the heavens. References again that when we die, we don't die. Our form simply changes. Um, we are joined together with that great cloud of witnesses, with that great um, communion of saints that make it so, so beautiful. I, I agree, Mary Kate. Some of the best words in the Book of Common Prayer changed, not ended. That gives me comfort. And I hope it gives you all comfort um, because life goes on. Our life goes on. And it goes on through our life in Christ. During the pandemic, because we weren't able to go into our church, some of the very first services we held at St. Albans were funerals, burials for those um, who had um, died during the pandemic. And this is our outdoor altar area to the, to the south of our church. Um, we, right before we, were, we shut down, we built an outdoor altar from stones that were used, um, that were taken out during the demolition for the expansion of our parish hall. And the service here was the very second service. So we celebrated Eucharist on Sunday and uh, did the funeral on Monday for a beloved member, um, a Vietnam War veteran. Uh, his name was Dennis Ricker. And over here, this was the fourth service that we did at St. Albans. Uh, following a baptism, um, we did a funeral burial service for one of our beloved members, a daughter of the King, Jan Steele. Yeah, Terry writes, during his mom's active dying stage, he read that in some hospice literature, he read that, you know, this change not ended in hospice literature. Death doesn't end something, it changes. Death ends a life. Does, death ends a life, but not a relationship. That is beautiful. Hospice is truly, truly a blessing. And then this last May, uh, we celebrated the uh, uh, life and burial of one of our deacons, a retired deacon in our church. Bishop Kim came up, and we actually held this at Main Park um, in Windsor. The Reverend, right, uh, the Reverend Deacon Dick Chella, um, and they had a bagpipe player. Now, I know I'm in the minority. I'm not a fan of bagpipes. Um, it sounds like a group of cicadas to me, uh, which 
is like nails on a chalkboard, but he did a beautiful job. And it was very honoring to be able to serve with our bishop um, as she celebrated uh, the life of our deacon. So that brings us back to our the relationship between death, resurrection, and our communion of saints. So we have a feast of all saints and the commemoration of all souls that we just celebrated on November 1st and November 2nd of our church. And this is, we are reminded of this when we pray in our prayers for the dead um, in our burial rite, that our brother or sister was washed in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. And we pray that God, Christ, give him or her a fellowship with all your saints. So we have a breakout groups discussion. I, I hope I didn't rush through that. So when you break out into groups, I want you to discuss what are your own beliefs about the afterlife? Is there a heaven and how would you describe it? Is there a hell? How would you describe it? And so that ends my presentation. We'll break out into our groups and then come back in about 20 minutes or so.